All right, let's see if this can work. All right. Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ, the Mark the 13th worship service recording inside and outside. We still have members that are out in the parking lot, and so uh, we provide that for them. They can listen to it on the, their car radios uh, while we're doing this. And also, you can watch it online, of course. If you're watching it online, you need your Bible, you need uh, some grape juice, you need your, your unleavened bread, and then you can sing along with us if you're watching this uh, at home. If you're in your car listening to it, uh, don't watch the screen. Remember, this side is, co is masked, this side is unmasked. And this is probably going to be the last time you see this, because apparently they're, they're uh, doing away with the mask mandate. So we're going to just do away with it as well as soon as that's done. So this will be the last time you see that. Good to see all of you here. We're glad the Lord's blessed you to be here with us. And it's good to see Rhonda. Glad to see you today. It's, it's been a while. Uh, and, and so we're, um, we're glad that you're here. Pray the Lord blesses you. And remember that we worship God by participating in the things that we're doing and thinking about them. And uh, we have We Worship that's going to happen in a, in a little while. And when that happens, I'll let you know. And those of you that have children that are young uh, will have a place to take them so they can listen to some age-appropriate material. Uh, th this week's lesson is going to be on the temptation of Jesus. Brother Sandy's going to do that for us. He's out. In the, he's in the back over here. We appreciate Sandy and all the work that he does, not just with us here in We Worship, but he's got a number of followers that follow him uh, online and listen to his, his material for the children. So we're just blessed to have him here. Uh, our first song is number 378. Everybody, please sit up and let's praise God together. And um, I was talking to Leroy this morning, and he's, and I said, there's something wrong with this pitch pipe. He goes, no, you got Robert cheese, and you can't hit the note thing. You know, so, so I, does anybody else have allergies right now? Oh, okay, thank you. I thought I was the only one, and I just can't sing. <laughs> 40 years ago, it was much better. <laughs> Okay, but we're going to praise God and do his will, and it's going to be all good for all of us. Amen. So thank you for being here. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but holy lead of Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is God, not his blood, support me in the wealthy flood. When all around my soul gives way, even is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with a trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Rest in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. We'll do the best we can with what God did. So, all good. 
<clears throat> I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life be gifts from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know. morning to sing praises to you and hear a lesson from your word. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, who came to earth and died for our sins. We're thankful for our visitors this morning and this beautiful day. And be with us as we worship in Christ's name. Amen. 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 If you're sitting thinking, I think it was just a month or two ago you sang this one. Yeah, I love this song. Amen. This song really brings you back to the core of why we're here and what Jesus did for us. It is powerful. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince
Good to see everyone this morning. Um, I got to thinking about what I was going to talk about this morning, and I think I have enough notes to keep us up here until about 10.30. Uh, Amen. I want to... <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to try not to make a sermon out of this, but, uh, has the question ever, or the thought ever crossed your mind says, why me, Lord? Back sometime in the nineties or maybe even the eighties, uh, songwriter, country songwriter, Chris Christopherson wrote a song says, why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you or the kindness you've shown? Tell me, Lord, if you think there's a way I can try to repay all I've taken from you. Maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself. on my way back to you. And I found a lot of scriptures that that could basically ask the same question. In Psalms 8, in verse 4, David writes, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yeah, you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. And without going through all these four other, four or five other references, I think I might have stumbled across the answer. And the answer that I found is in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. That was, uh, it's a quote. It's not really a quote, but a kind of a paraphrase from Isaiah, where Isaiah talks about God's going to bring his children back for his own name's sake. And I don't know about you, but that takes a lot of pressure off of me. It's not about what I do. It's not about what I have done to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known. It's about what God did. It's about what Christ did for us. And when he says he did it for my name's sake, he's talking about the promise that he made, that God made to Abraham back in Genesis 12. For through your seed, all nations will be blessed. It's not about what we do. It's not about how good we are. It's not about how much good we do. It's about Jesus Christ being the promise of Abraham to Abraham. And we stand here today looking at two very simple little emblems. The bread, which we discussed last week, is his body. And the fruit of the vine, which is his blood. And we've talked about many times we partake of this and in actually eating Christ's body and drinking Christ's blood, we become more like Christ. So we don't do this to nourish our physical body. We do this to nourish our spirit so we can become more like him. I want to ask Pedro to say a prayer for the bread. Dear Lord, we thank you 
we thank you so much for the opportunity we have today that we have to partake of the Lord's Supper to help us remember the sacrifice that you did for all of us for the remission of our sins. We ask the Lord to help us to remember you every day, every second that we, that we got this life, not only the first day of the week. We ask the Lord to help us the grace, remember the great sacrifice you did for us. And we ask you to be with us always and forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> I love all the analogies that we read about of God calling his people, his sheep. The analogies to the sheep as having no natural defenses, frail, they give up easily. All of that fits us. But I read a story recently <clears throat> That was a real eye opener for me that I had never heard before. And the story is about a shepherdess who was out watching her sheep, and one of her sheep got bit by a snake. And she was waiting for the sheep's head to swell up and just roll over and die. And the sheep just kept grazing. Next day, the sheep was out there doing just fine. So she ran across an older shepherd and she asked him about the snake biting the sheep and how long is it going to take for this venom to, to kill my sheep? And he said, oh, he said, it, it won't. He said, he said, a sheep's blood has a natural immunity to snake venom. And whoa, okay, how can I apply that? We drink Christ's blood. Christ has a natural immunity to the power of Satan. Remember that when the, in the wilderness wanderings when, this, when God sent the serpents among the, the Jews who were complaining because they didn't have enough to eat. They, they were complaining about God's plan because uh, he promised us a, a promised land and and we're out here wandering around the desert. So he sent these serpents to bite people. And God told Moses, he said, okay, I've heard, I've heard him complaining. I've heard him repent. I've heard their remorse. He said, make a bronze serpent, put it on a, a stick, uh, a staff, stick it up in the air. And anyone who looks at that will be saved from dying. That's referred to by John in the New Testament that Christ had to be raised up as the serpent was in the wilderness, that anyone who looks on him would be saved. And I'm thinking, okay, now if Christ's blood has this anti venom in it, and we drink his blood every week, then we should have that anti venom in us because it's making us like Christ. And, and just to kind of uh, enforce that a little bit, in John chapter 8, in verse 17. He says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
So as we drink Christ's blood, that Christ himself proclaimed it was his blood of the covenant to Abraham, we have an immunity. We have the power of Jesus Christ in our body. We have the love of God in our body. And we are to be more like Christ. Would you please bow with me? Now, Father God, we thank you so much for these two very simple emblems that represent, that do not represent, they are by Christ's own proclamation, his body and his blood. Father, the more that we learn about the analogies of your people being sheep and about our Lord and Savior being the Lamb of God, at the same time he was our great shepherd, that he protects us, he guides us, he defends us, there's nothing that can separate us from your love through him. We thank you that these two little emblems can be had all over the world. We don't have to go to a special tabernacle or synagogue or building. But you have promised where two or more are gathered in your name. You are in our midst. And we can partake of these emblems at home during a pandemic, watching preachers on Zoom. We can still commune with you by these two simple little emblems. Your wisdom is awesome. to know that this bread is the unleavened bread and the leaven represents sin. There's nothing in this bread and the, and the blood of Christ that we drink has a natural anti-venom in it that protects us from the darts of Satan through Jesus. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for everything you do, everything you have ever done to bring us to where we are today. And we trust in your promises that you will keep us in the fold of your arms and protect us until we meet on the other side of Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. This brings us to a time where we pray for our blessings. And this congregation has been tremendously blessed. And for the members here um, that were here through last year, I will again say it's getting close to tax time. And if you need a letter of your contributions, please see me. Um, as a treasurer of the church here for 35 years, I can honestly tell you that the money has been used to the best of my knowledge, according to scripture, for benevolence and evangelism. And because of that, God just keeps blessing us. And I appreciate each and every one of you who give up your means each, each and every week. Pedro, say a prayer for the blessings. Dear Father in heaven, we continue uh, giving you thanks for 
all the things you have done for us. At this time, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you provide for us in the past and provide for us today. And we thank you for all the members that give with cheerful heart. We ask the Lord to continue blessing us in the future. We ask you to be with us always. We ask you to forgive for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. After what we still just talked about, what we all discerning the of the of the Lord, it's the least we can do is follow him all the way through our lives if we can lead us to heaven. Amen. We are the promises, kind is the word, dear far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. In a great example is a pattern for me. When he leads a far children now is the time to take them to we worship if you'd like to take them there we encourage you to to do that if you're visiting with us for the first time we're glad you're here and pray the lord blesses you for being here and you'll notice that in the sermon outline there that you receive there's some blank spaces those blank spaces are underlined on the overhead so you can write those in there and if you want to you can write those in people seem to be able to pay attention more when they can write them in and take notes and so that's the reason we give those to you and so if you'd like to do that, you're welcome to do that. Or you can just listen and, and fill them in later if you want, or not fill them in at all, whatever. Uh, it's up to you. And so we're glad that you're here. John 14, beginning at verse 1. It says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord... Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me 
has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. As we've been looking at the book of John, we've noticed that God created the world through the word, and that the word came to bring us to the Father in heaven. But just exactly how does he do that? And how is that accomplished? Remember that he also came to establish God's kingdom. And so as we're reading in the book of John, we notice that John chapter 14 follows John chapter 13. At the end of John chapter 13, you had the betrayal of Jesus. You had the fact that Simon, that Judas Iscariot was going to betray Jesus. And so the, that discussion having gone on, the disciples were a little bit sad. They were a little bit beside themselves, not understanding what was going to go on, especially since they had been brought up in a culture that told them that when Messiah comes, he's going to set up this kingdom. This kingdom is going to be on earth. It's going to be a utopia on earth. And therefore, the, the Messiah is never going to die. And they believe Jesus is the Messiah. Matter of fact, they confess that to him in Matthew chapter 16. And they confess that they believe that he's the Christ. And he, he says that he's going to be betrayed. And so they're beside themselves. So Jesus says to them in John chapter 1 and verse 4, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And so Jesus is going to tell them how this betrayal is actually going to work out for their good. And as he does that, he tells them, I know you're troubled. I know this is bothering you. I know the idea that I'm going to be betrayed is something that goes against what you maybe thought or you're thinking. Because if you remember, even when Jesus said that he was going to be betrayed, and he was going to be crucified, uh, that his disciples and Peter said, Lord, I won't let that happen to you. And so Jesus is pointing out to them that you need to trust God. And not only do you trust God, but you need to trust me. You see, man isn't to trust in certain things. We're not to trust in our own understanding. We're not to trust in what we think. We're supposed to trust in what God says, but some people trust in comfort and idols and philosophies and angels and men. Some people trust in everything, basically, except for God. In Colossians chapter 2, down here at verse 18, as the writer of the Colossian letter is writing to them about uh, people who follow other things, he says this beginning in verse 18. He says, Take care that no one keeps defrauding you of your prize by delighting in humility and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding firmly to the head, from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. Paul wrote Colossians to a group of people who lived in an area where they had all kinds of superstitions superstitions and religious ideas and he was telling them you need to make sure and not believe in those things there's some people who believe in angels and they believe in philosophies and they believe in, in idols and they believe in just being comfortable and that's what they believe in but God's pointing out and God's telling us that we're only supposed to believe in God God's the only one we're supposed to worship and believe in in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6 when it's talking about Jesus it says and when he again brings the, the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And so the Bible says that when Jesus, when God brought Jesus into the world, that God told the angels, you worship him. You worship Jesus, my son, in the world. And why is that important? Because what the Bible teaches is we're not to worship anything except God. In Revelation 19, as John was writing the book of Revelation, he was so amazed at the message that was given to him that he fell down before an angel who was delivering the message to him in an act of worship. And this is what the angel says to him, beginning in verse 10 of chapter 19. He says, then I fell at his feet to worship, 
But he, the angel, said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so as John was bowing down at the feet of this angel, this angel said, don't do that. You're not to worship angels. You're not to worship any other created creature or created being. You are to worship God. God is the one who is to be worshiped. And in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 8, at a second uh, time, as John was writing and was just so overwhelmed with the message of God, it says, and I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the word, uh, the words of this book, worship God. Now, Jesus just said in verse one, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, I want you to notice what he didn't say. Jesus didn't say you believe in God, believe me. He said, believe in me. He said, just like you believe in God, you believe in me. Jesus was taking the exact same position and place as the Father and said, you can worship the Father and you can worship me. And we know we're not supposed to worship angels. We know we're not supposed to worship created creatures. And so Jesus is basically saying, you can worship me because I am God, just like the Father is God. And just like the Holy Spirit is God. And so he's pointing out that you can trust God and you can trust me. See, Jesus just told them that I'm going to be betrayed. And they don't know if they can trust him. They don't know if they can depend on him. And Jesus is saying, you can depend on me just like you can depend on God in heaven. Trust me. Jesus says to believe in him. Not just to believe what he says, but to believe in him. You can believe what I say if I'm reading the scriptures to you, but you don't believe in me. We don't believe in anybody save God. That's why John, uh, that's why Jesus says in John 8 and verse 24, as John records these events that Jesus said when he was on earth, he said, therefore, I, Jesus said to you that, uh, uh, that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus said that if you don't believe that I am he, and you understand that expression, uh, I am he, this, this word is actually not in the Greek. The he is not in the Greek. Jesus says, if you believe that I am, that's God the Father. That's the God that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. When Moses said, they're going to ask me your name, and he says, tell them, I am. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And in John 11, when Jesus is talking to Martha and Mary about the resurrection and about life from the dead, he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, again, I want you to notice he didn't say believe me. He says, believe in me. Jesus isn't just saying, believe what I'm telling you. He's saying, believe in me. Believe in the very things that I'm doing. And so Jesus comforts his disciples who are worried because he says he's going to be betrayed. And Jesus comforts them and says, look, you can trust God and you can trust me. You can put your faith in me. I know what I'm doing. I know what has to happen. It sounds like maybe I'm going to come to my end because I'm going to be betrayed. But you have to trust me. Matter of fact, he says in verse two of John 14. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And we often read this verse and we think what Jesus is talking about is he's talking about me going to heaven. And he's talking about the fact that, that he's going to prepare a place for us in heaven. And though it's true that someday we will be with God in heaven, I don't believe that's the subject here. I believe the subject here is more than that. Matter of fact, what's interesting is it says, in my father's house are many dwellings. Now, the King James had that word dwelling as mansions. But that word, that word dwelling in the New American Standard is only used two times in Scripture. It's used here, and it's used a little further down when it says the Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell in you. It's a dwelling. It's a room. It's a place where somebody's going to dwell and reside is what he's talking about. Jesus is saying, look, unless I go, then you're not going to have room 
to come into that relationship with God. And so he's pointing out for them that it is his temple that God lives in. Remember in the Old Testament, God had that temple? And you remember what that temple was about? That temple was where God lived on earth down here. He lived in that temple. At least that's what it represented, didn't it? It represented him living on earth in that house among his people. But what's interesting is that in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that God doesn't live in a physical temple anymore. Matter of fact, even in the Old Testament, he didn't live in a physical temple. In the Old Testament, when Solomon built that temple, the very first temple, he said to God in his dedication as he prayed, I know that heaven, that, that you fill heaven and earth. How can you live in this little house? But it represented where he was supposed to live. It represented his room. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, where God talks about the church and he talks about the saved. He says, beginning in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, as he, he writes to us, or as Paul writes to us, he says, so then you are no longer strangers and foreign, foreigners, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Jesus says that the Jews and the Gentiles who are in Christ Jesus are now God's household. You are God's dwelling. You are where God lives. Don't you have a house? When you leave here, you're going to go to your house, aren't you? And when you go to your house, what are you going to do there? You're going to live there. Well, God has a house. And guess what God's going to do in his house? He's going to live there. And in order for God to live there, God has to get that house ready. We haven't had too many of you over our house lately. That's because we're remodeling our house on the inside. And it's a wreck. Because when you remodel stuff, everything's a wreck. Until you finally get it all set up and then you feel well enough to invite people over to be able to come and visit with you. Jesus has to come and get his house ready. But he says that house is the church. In verse 20, he says, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. You see, the church isn't a place where you and I go. It's what you and I are. We are the church. We are the place where God dwells. And I'm not talking about this assembly. I'm talking about each and every one of us. Each and every one of us represent the temple of God. Each and every one of us represent where God's supposed to live. And so, therefore, when you're mean, it looks like God is mean. When you're vindictive, it looks like God's vindictive. When you cuss and curse, it looks like God is rude and cusses and curses. You see, when Jesus went to prepare a place, he wasn't going to prepare a place for us to go to heaven. He was going to prepare, prepare room for us in God's house. He was going to make it possible for God to dwell with us and for us to dwell with God because it doesn't really matter where you are if you are dwelling with God and God is dwelling with you. And the church is God's house. And if he, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, but Christ was faithful as a son over his house. Well, who is that house? He says, whose house we are. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end, God says, we are his house. He's prepared us for his dwelling. He's prepared us to be part of his family in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. He says, but in case I am delayed, I write so that uh, you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. We're his house. We're his family. God is supposed to dwell in us. It's not we find a place to go and we go, I found the place. It's we are the place. We are the house. And either God lives in us or he doesn't. It doesn't matter if we're sitting in this assembly or not. If God's not dwelling in us, we're not his house. And if God isn't ruling in us, we're not his house. 
Jesus came to make room for us in God's house. In Hebrews 13 and verse 12, it says, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the camp. Remember that Old Testament temple when it was first built? You remember how many bulls and sacrifices and animal sacrifices they made in order to dedicate the temple itself? They dedicated the, the altar. They dedicated the, the, the holy of holy. They dedicated the earth. They, they cleansed everything with blood. Because it represented us. And in order for us to have room in God's house, we have to be sanctified and we have to be cleansed. And that happens only by and through the blood of Jesus. So this betrayal that they're looking at, and they're thinking, oh, that's terrible. Jesus is going, no, it's good. Because without a betrayal, I don't die. And without my death, there is no room for you where I am so that you can be with me. And where is Jesus? He's with God. You see, our problem is we think physically. We think of physical locations. But Jesus is with God wherever he's at. And God can be with us wherever we are. In verse 3 of John 14 says, And if God, uh, uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where is Jesus? He's with God. That's where he's at. He's with God. Yes, I know right now he's sitting up in heaven at the right hand of God. But what he's doing for us, he's making room for us in God's house so you and I can be part of God's house wherever that happens to be. Wherever we live with God, we're going to get to be with him. Atonement has to be made for sin. It has to be made. In Exodus chapter 32 and 30, this is when Moses was up on the mountain, you remember? And he was receiving the law. Remember what the people were doing down the bottom of the mountain? They were partying, but they were partying in an immoral way because they made that golden calf because they thought Moses died up, up there on that mountain. God killed him. So they built themselves a golden calf and Moses is coming down to try to fix this. And in order for him to fix it, he says in, in Exodus 32 and 30, he says, on the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin. And now I'm going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you. You know, that word atonement, is at one meant. God needs to bring us back together with him. And that's what atonement is. Atonement is God getting us back together with him. And that requires something that you and I cannot do. It takes Jesus to do it. And so Jesus then tells them in verse four, and you know the way where I'm going. Now, I want you to understand that, that I... I, I I don't think this rendering is bad, but I think because of the way we think, we don't catch it the way it ought to be caught. Because it just as easily could have been said, and you know how I'm going. Not so much I'm going to a place, but you know how I'm going, or at least you're supposed to know how I'm going. You're supposed to know the way there. In other words, I, I tell somebody, do you know how to get there? I could also say, do you know the way there? Do you know how to get there? Well, of course, we all know how to get there now because we have Google. <laughs> but before we had Google, we were all lost sometimes. We didn't know how to get there. We didn't know the way. And so Jesus says to them, you know the way where I'm going. What does that mean? Well, Jesus says, you guys should know what it takes for me to get a relate for God to have a relationship with you. If you look at the Old Testament and you notice all the animal sacrifices that are over there, you you sure, certainly have to know the way. But Israel had left the way. In Isaiah chapter thirty five. This is a chapter that's written to Israel, and it's written to them and to Judah. 
because they're going off into captivity because they have lost the way. They've lost the way. They don't know the way anymore. And so he's writing to them that God's going to send them off into captivity, but God is going to bring back the way. And he says for them in chapter 35, and it's a really short chapter, so I want to read it here with you as, as we get into it. He says in chapter 35 and verse 1, the wilderness and the desert rejoice. Now, when he's talking about this, if you think of it physically, you're going to miss out what he's talking about. All of, the, all of the references in here that talk about physical things should be applied in a spiritual manner. When he talks about the wilderness, that's a place where there's no spiritual goodness and no spiritual way to get right with God. They're in a spiritual, they're in a spiritual desert. So as I read this, rather than thinking about physical things, use these illustrations to think about the spiritual relationship that God has had with them. And so let's see what he says. He says, the wilderness, uh, the wilderness and the desert will rejoice. And the desert will shout for joy and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with joy and jubilation. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God, strengthen and exhausted and make the feeble strong. <coughs> Say to those with anxious hearts, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The retribution of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of those who are blind will be opened and the ears of those who are deaf will be unstopped. Then those who, who leap, uh, 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 those who limp will leap like a deer and the tongues of those who cannot speak will shout for joy for waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert place. Remember when Jesus talked to the woman at the well? And he said, I can give you living water. Samaria was this parched, spiritually parched ground. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you living water. And you're going to have living water spring up in Samaria, that desert place. And the scorched land will become a pool. And the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place. Grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there. A roadway. And it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for the one who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious animal go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the redeemed of the Lord will return and, and come to Zion with joyful shouting and everlasting joy will be on their heads and they will obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. They should have known the way. It's not like God didn't tell them about the way. He did. He told them what the way was way back in Genesis chapter 18. When God was talking to Abraham, when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he says to him in verse 19, as God's talking to the angels or God's talking to himself, he says, for I have chosen him, Abraham, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. And what is the way of the Lord? By doing righteousness. And justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he had spoken about him. What is the way? It's righteousness and justice. It's what we lost when we sinned. It's what we lost when we became selfish and self-centered. And started thinking about ourselves instead of thinking about God. And so he says, you need to know the way. That's what... Uh, Paul was referring to in Acts 24 and verse 14 when he's on trial and he says, but this I admit to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. He says this thing that they call the way, he says, I follow it. I'm following the way in order to serve God. And so Thomas says to him in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Well, why did he say that? Well, he said that because he's thinking of physical locations. That's why he said that. 
which way are you going? Are you going that way? You're going north, east, south, or west? Which, which way you're going? We don't know which way you're going. So if we don't know which way you're going, then how do we know the way? That's why in Luke chapter 19 and verse 11, it says, while they were listening to these things, Jesus talking, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Now, why does he tell this parable? He says, because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. You see, this parable that he's going to teach, and I'm going to tell you in just a minute, you know it. But this parable that he's telling them, he's telling them because they think the kingdom of God is going to show up right here and right there in Jerusalem. And if they make him king, it's going to show up there. But you know what parable Jesus gives them? The parable of the talents. You remember how that parable starts off? It starts off this man, this king went away to receive a kingdom and left his servants. And then you remember the end of the parable? He comes back to find out what they did. Well, well, wait a minute. How could he go away to receive a kingdom and expect his people to do what he says if he went over there to get a kingdom? Because it has nothing to do with where Jesus is at. It has to do with who's ruling you. President Biden lives away over there in Washington, but you're right here. You have to, you have to do what he tells you to do right here. <clears throat> he doesn't have to be looking at you in the face in order for you to do his will. Either he's the king or he's not. And Jesus is going up to heaven. And when he goes up there, he's going to become king and he's going to be up there and he's going to be king, but his kingdom is going to be here. His rule is going to be here. His rule is going to be everywhere where people serve him and follow him. And so Jesus said, if you think the kingdom's showing up because it's a local place, you misunderstand what the kingdom of God is. And by the way, there's still Christians who are looking for that kind of kingdom. They're waiting for Jesus to come back and kind of blow everybody up. And then live on this world for a while. And that's going to be his kingdom. But that's not what that parable said. The parable says when he comes back, it's over. He's coming to find out what his people did while he was receiving the kingdom. And therefore, Jesus says to them when Thomas says to him, we don't, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus says to them in verse 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. There isn't any way to get to God except through Jesus. He is the, he is the life. He is the way. He is the truth. By the way, you remember who's the only person that can give life, right? God. God's the only one who gives life. Jesus says, I'm the life. Not I'll bring you to the Father and you can know the life. He says, I am the life. He said, he said to Martha and Mary, if you believe in me, you will not die. Because the only way you and I can get access to the Father is through Jesus. Just like the only way those people could use that temple was for all those animal sacrifices to cleanse it first, and then they were allowed to enter in there, then they were allowed to have room in there. First Peter three and verse eighteen puts it like this: For Christ also died for our for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Jesus makes it possible for us to have fellowship with God because it's only in Jesus that we find holiness. We don't find holiness through our own efforts or through our own work. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try as hard as we can to be holy and to live righteously. But holiness is found in Jesus. Verse 3 of Ephesians 1 says, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. How in the world can you and I be holy and blameless before him? How in the world can David be holy and blameless before God? How in the world can, can Abraham and Moses be holy and blameless when they were individuals who killed people, committed adultery, lied? How in the world can they be holy? Only through the atoning blood of Jesus. And how can I be holy who've lied and cheated and connived how can I be holy? Only through Jesus. Only through the suffering of the Son of Man. And so Jesus says to them in verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and, will, and have seen him. He says, if you know me, then you know the Father. Jesus is really saying, if you understand me, then you understand God. But you remember that famous verse that everybody knows, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have eternal life. What did God do for us in the beginning of creation? He gave us life. What does Jesus do for us in the recreation? He gives us life. If you had seen Jesus, you've seen God. That's what Jesus is pointing out to them. He's pointing out that to know me is to know God. <clears throat> but again, because of their upbringing and their culture, Philip says to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Show us God. You're here and we want to see God. You want to take us to the Father. That's great. Can we see God? Because they're thinking a polytheistic attitude towards God. You know what polytheism is, right? It means there's more than one God. So they have kind of like the God of the rain and the God of the sun and the God of the moon. They have all these different gods, right? And so they have all these different gods that do all these different things for them. And that's kind of what they're looking at. They're kind of looking at Jesus while you're, you're one God over here. And then there's the other God, the Father. So we want to see him because he's different from you because his other God is different from you. And they fail to understand God's nature. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 8, when Jesus is talking about, about eating meat sacrificed to idol, he says, we know that there, is, that there is no such thing as an idol. So God says, there's really no idols. People make up idols. Buddha isn't, isn't really going to save you, okay? None of, the, none of the Indian gods can save you. None of the spirit gods of the, of the Indians can save you, or the Native Americans, sorry about that, uh, can save you. There's no idols. He says, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and, there is, uh, uh, and, there, and that there is no God but one. One God. So how in the world can Philip say, show us the Father, and Jesus goes, I'm here. I'm right here. And you know, the, we live in a physical world, and all I can give us and all God can give us is physical examples of spiritual realities. And so as I think of this, I think of you and me. And I think if somehow I was able to go to another planet or maybe even aliens showed up here in a spacecraft and I'm the first guy they saw. And they come to me and they say, hey, Mike, we want to see human. What would I say? You're looking at me. You're looking at me. I'm human. When you see Jesus, you see God. When you see God the Father, you see God. When you see the Holy Spirit, you see God. That's the reason why Jesus says when you baptize somebody, you baptize them in the name of the Father, baptize them in the Son, and then baptize them in the Holy Spirit. It's not you're baptizing them in three different gods. It's you're baptizing them in that united God. 
that one God. And so when Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father, Jesus. Are you serious? Seriously? Verse 19, verse 9, Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? You ever heard the expression familiarity breeds contempt? You see, that's what happens with God's people. The more familiar they get with God, the more they lose respect for him. That's the reason why men sometimes when our wives make dinner, we don't tell them thank you. They're supposed to do that. That's their job. I've become familiar with them. So I don't have to tell them that. When the husband cuts the yard, hey, that's his job. He's supposed to do that. I don't have to tell him thank you. And that's what Jesus is saying. Have I been so long with you, Philip, that you've become contemptuous of me? That you don't really see who I am? You think I'm like you? See, we often think God's like us. He's not. We're trying to be like him. And he says, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is God. And he was God down here in the flesh. In John 1 and verse 23, it says, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and you shall call his name. Emmanuel. Why do they call him Emmanuel? Because he's God with us. Well, he looks just like a man. He's not. He's God with us in the flesh. And Jesus says, well, if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least believe what I'm speaking. At least believe what I'm saying. Verse 10 says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. He said, Jesus says, listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to my words. What have I been telling you? What have I been saying? Remember how we started off our study of John 1 and verse 1? In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. He's God. He's the word of God. In John 7, verse 46, that's why the officers who went to arrest him said this about him. Never has a man spoken this, uh, uh, the way this man speaks. Jesus is the word of God. Believe him. Believe what he says. In John 14 and verse 11, Jesus then says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Jesus says, if you can't believe that God is in me and I'm, I'm in God, that, that he's just like me, that we're exactly the same, then at least look at what I'm doing. Look at the works that I'm doing. Well, what works was he doing? Well, in Acts 2 and verse 22, it says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. What was Jesus doing? Signs and miracles and wonders. But more than that, I want to suggest to you. In Acts 10 and verse 38, as as um, Peter's talking to the household of Cornelius. He says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. What did Jesus do? What's the work of God? Doing good. Loving people. He created the world because he loved people. And he wanted people to have a place to stay. He forgave people. 
that he wanted them to have a relationship with him who is the only source of blessing. And what is Jesus doing? He's doing the work of God. Yeah, he did miracles and wonders and signs. But he went about doing good. Healing people. Feeding them. Restoring them to life. He went about doing what God does. Jesus says, if you don't believe me because I don't look like God, you got to believe me because I'm acting like him. <clears throat> and so in verse 12, Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to, to the Father. How in the world can we do greater works than what Jesus does? What greater works can we do? I mean, he did everything. He raised the dead. I've never raised the dead. He's healed the sick with a word. I've never healed the sick with a word. He's fed a multitude with a few loaves and a few fishes. I got to send Kate to the grocery store. So how in the world can we do greater, greater works than he did? Because we can do something he wasn't able to do while he was here. And that is preach the kingdom of God is here. In Acts 8 and verse 12, but when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. You see, while Jesus was on earth, they were waiting for the kingdom of God to come. They were waiting for this promise of the Messiah. They were waiting for that to happen. And Jesus says, when I go to heaven, you're going to be able to say something I never could have said. You're going to be able to teach people about the kingdom of God. And that's not talking about some little church. Talking about God's rule and our ability to be able to be part of his kingdom. In John 20 and verse 25, when Paul was, uh, was on trial, he says, Now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. When John the Baptist came, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles aren't preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles are preaching the kingdom of heaven is here and it's now. And Jesus is in heaven and he received that kingdom. And the question is, are you going to listen to him? In chapter 28 and verse 31, it says preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the word Lord means king, right? Part of the kingdom. Preaching the kingdom of God and the teaching of the Lord, the king, Jesus Christ. With all openness. That's what he's teaching. And not only that. But they get people into it. Acts 2. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain. That God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom he crucified. Now when they heard this. They were pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Brethren what shall we do? And you know the rest of the verse right? And Peter said to them. <laughs> And please be baptized in the name of the Lord, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll receive the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus couldn't teach that. Jesus couldn't tell him that. Jesus couldn't do that until he went up to heaven. Then when he went up to heaven and sat at the right hand of God, then we get into his kingdom. Because until then, if he did it on earth and he died, his kingdom would have ended. But it's in heaven. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, it says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption through the forgiveness, uh, the forgiveness of sins. He sanctified us. Set us apart. So in verse 13, Jesus says to them, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that my father may be glorified in the son. Jesus says, when I get up to heaven and I receive my kingdom, then when you ask me anything, I can do it. Joe Biden couldn't do anything for us until he became president. And after he became president, then he could do things for us. Until then, he couldn't. 
Jesus says, when I'm up there, then you can ask in my name. In 1 John 5, verse 14, it says, this is the confidence which we uh, have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He's going to promote his kingdom, and we're going to promote his kingdom too. And so Jesus will glorify the Father in us. In Ephesians 3, and verse 12, he says, in verse 11, he says, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose, which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And how is it that we glorify him? By doing his will. By becoming like him. And loving people the way he loved us. And verse 14 therefore says, and if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You see, he's given us authority to act on his behalf. In Acts 3 and verse 12, it says, but Peter Having healed a lame man, Peter uh, saw this when the people came to him and he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we have made this man walk? What made that lame man walk? It wasn't they were apostles. It was that they did it in the name of Jesus Christ. And so all we do, we're to do through his power. Colossians 3 and verse 17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And that's why Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 says, and let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Where do we get those good works from? Jesus. Because he prepared a place for us and a room for us. And it took his death on a cross and the betrayal. So if you believe in God, believe also in him and let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. God spoke creation into existence by his word. And the word is the way, the truth, and the life that leads to the father. And those who believe Jesus is the only way to the father. To be baptized to be God's dwelling place. And so we're going to sing about our victory that we have in Christ Jesus as soon as Dawn runs in here. <laughs> I have to stop the CD at the right time. <laughs> Excuse me. In camp along the hills of mighty Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in bells below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph. God. By faith, they like the whirlwind's breath, sweat on our every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory. Faith. And onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all great about. The earth shall tremble beneath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh,
here is Troy. Oh, Maggie said, all right, I grew a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Read a little bit and got a little older, huh? <laughs> Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, at this time, we approach that throne of grace. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the message brought to us this morning. There is a God, Father, and we know it. Father, we pray that we take it, that we'll take this message to heart, to reinstall that there is a God, that you're always there, that you've been there all the time, every day, all night. L letting us know, Father, that you're still with us, whatever that we do, if we let go of your hand, Father, that you are still there. Father, we pray that we take this message to heart, that we will have the answers that are asked of us, not only the answers that are asked of us, but to even put to heart to where we become better, more like you, that the question may not be asked, just to look upon us as we are out in the world, that our light shines bright enough for those to see. Be curious to them till they walk up to us and say, who are you? Why are you like this? Father, we just pray that you continue to love us. There's things that we do. I know that you look at us and not like our earthly father, but there are times you may want to correct and to chastise us, Father, to bring us back on point. Father, we pray for the leadership of this world, the leaderships, that they finally see something that war is not necessary. Big countries taking little countries, big fish biting the little fish, always trying to gain and there's nothing really to be gained. And focus more on you, Heavenly Father. This world would be a better place. But it is the fact that as long as we are here, that the devil will raise up and take the weak, even try the strong. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll be strong enough to weather the wind and the deserts, the unfamiliar, that when the wind and the deserts and the, what the seas calm, that we'll be there to continue on in stride. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the elderly, that they have passed this word on as well to the young ones, to the next generation. We ask Heavenly Father that you be with those who have passed on, be with those that are left behind, Father, that we are the ones that noticed, noticing that the ones that have passed on, that we need to keep moving. We need to keep striving. We need to keep you in the forefront of our minds at all times, that this is the way that we have to leave here in order to get there. Thank you so much for loving us, Father. Forgive us of our sins, to strengthen us where we are weak. I ask this prayer. In thy son Jesus' name, shall we all say, Amen. Amen.
Real quick, just a few quick announcements. Uh, can you pray for George and Faye? Ladies Fellowship and the Service Report is next week. Uh, Lee and Karen are not traveling. They're over there. And so we're glad they're back and uh, home safe. We hope all of you keep reading your Bible. I just received a message from Karen Daly that says to pray for her friend, uh, Suzette, uh, who's a double amputee, and she had a heart attack when she was having dialysis. So if you could pray for her uh, when you have a chance to do that. And it's good to see Trish here. She's visiting with us. We're glad she's here and pray God blesses her for having been here. If there's nothing further. Thank you. And you're dismissed. Thank you.